Hi, Happy New Year. I did a great interview uh, a couple of days ago on December 27th with a woman named Karen Wells. And she's an amazing priestess from Portland area. Um, she's been around a long time, so she delivers some more of the history of our uh, community in this interview. But she also has a perspective as a woman of color uh, in the Portland area trying to find like-minded folk. So I hope you enjoy what you learn from Karen Wells. Here we go. Hi, Karen. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, <laughs> staying out of harm's way. Um, enjoying the morning. Uh, enjoy the sunlight. Actually, enjoy the sun. Sun is good. Any, any day there's a day of sun, it's a good day. I have to agree with that. Yeah. So I want to thank you for agreeing to come and uh, do my interview. And uh, I hope you're having a lovely December freezing cold morning in the Portland area. Um, but let's, uh, let's get started with the first question, which is, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to my audience and tell us... Uh, how you describe yourself as a spiritual being. Okay. Um, my name is Karen Elaine Wells. Um, I lived in Portland for over 45 years. I think we're, we're pushing 46. Um, originally came to Portland in uh, 1974. Uh, Born, raised in Southern California and San Diego. Uh, it was a bit of a shock to my system that coming from San Diego to, which is another day in paradise every day, to Portland, which is, uh, yeah, it rains, like often, like a lot. And there are months of gray. So, um, yeah, um, I, been married to my wife for going on 26 now, 26 years, uh, Priscilla. Um, oh, and, and for this, in, in case people are, that I may mention are not out, uh, I'm just going to use first name um, for confidentiality. Um, people can out themselves, <laughs> but I, I, you know, Gonna respect their, um, their 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 privacy. Yeah, we do um, appreciate that around here for sure. So yeah, because um, I my life has been a series of coming out, so to speak, um, coming out the, the process of revealing who I believe myself to be in the world uh, and putting a name on it and expressing that. Uh, so coming out pagan uh, happened somewhere in, in the 90s, I believe. Um, it uh, was kind of, kind of happen chance. Um, and looking for, for women's community that was not grounded in, uh, in the Christian faith traditions. Um, I was, uh, I was raised in, uh, uh I'm, I'm the middle child, uh, of three. Uh, I have an older brother and a younger sister. And we... Let's see. My mother was a person who was involved with uh, with religion. Father was not, uh, and the religion that she was heavily involved in was uh, the title is Christian Science. It's a uh, it's a metaphysical um, tradition that grew out of a blending of Quaker. Christianity, uh, Bible something, <laughs> Baptist, Christian philosophy and traditions, and a heavy-handed dose 
of what they like to call mind of the matter, metaphysical. And so from very early on, um, since we were not practicing a mainstream Christian, uh, African-American uh, flavored Christian tradition, we were uh, coached very early on to essentially be in the closet about our religious observances or our, our religious practices, which for someone under the age of 10 is really confusing. Um, we were essentially told, don't tell anybody that you're a Christian scientist. And that was very odd, very awkward, because of course, going to school, all, all the black kids said, so which church do you go to? And it's like, uh, what do I say? And when I did try to say, you know, there, you know, I, I got the response of, oh, that's so weird. Why you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Um, so then welcome to the closet. So <laughs> there I went. And uh, then fast forward to the 90s and being here in Portland and uh, looking for a spirituality practice that was not steeped in standard African-American Baptist uh, shame, guilt based as I, as I saw it traditions. And although it's not to say I did not try to go to some of the black churches, I, I did. Um, I tend to uh, view myself as a chameleon, which, which is a good thing, but it's not so good. The, the good part is that I, I can blend in and I have a lot, a lot of skills that blend in. The bad part or the difficult part to navigate is not knowing where I actually do fit in and where is my tribe and who is my tribe and all those searching questions. So then um, in, in the quest of finding a tribe, I was steeped in, in the uh, women's community of Portland. And at that time in, uh, well, yeah, at that time, um uh, early mid 70s early 80s uh it was a the white lesbian culture of southeast portland and so yeah my some formative uh advancement quote unquote in rudimentary spirituality um came about during those years and then there was, okay, keep going forward. So then the 90s hit, and I made friends with uh, a woman named Laverne who owned Chrome Magic. And she was like the first black woman that I came across who not only knew about a uh, alternative spirituality um, and practices, but actually had a shop that catered to the pagan community. It's like, oh my God, Laverne, you're wonderful. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I, I struck up a friendship with her. And uh, then she she is such a Sagittarian. No, not Sagittarian. She's, um, she's a Scorpio. And Scorpios are very busy people um, and very creative and they're very wonderful. And many across, across my path. Um, and Laverne decided that it would be really good to uh, form a group of black women and to explore uh, African-based spirituality tradition and explore them in such a way as to make them our own, to uh, to reinvent or to amend the practices that fit us uh, in our, our place and time, uh, that being the Pacific Northwest uh, and Oregon. So 
And the group was called Daughters of the Tribe. And I was part of that group for, I would say, oh, golly, I think the Daughters of the Tribe went on for almost eight years. And um, that, that, was, that was really great. Um, we uh, investigated traditions, we shared food, we, uh, we were a support for each other in, in our lives, in our various, uh, our various accomplishments uh, of family, of, you know, family drama, whatnot, whatever. And so the uh, Daughters of the Tribe, there was um, um, well, oh, so there was a summer solstice that Sister Spirit was hosting that they had hosted for many years at that point, well, several years at that point, at MacGyver Park uh, on the west side. And we were invited to participate in main ritual and also to do a women's ritual and i would say it was that summer solstice at my guy card the sister spirit was my actual grand launch into the portland metro pagan community and i think that happened Oh golly, let's see. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. I would say, I think it's 94, um, 1994. And I, <laughs> I created, I facilitated, I presented the, the, uh, the women's mystery, so women's ritual. And it was centered around honey. <laughs> and it was great. Let me ask you a quick question about that. Um, how big was Daughters of the Tribe? How many members did it have? Um, we never made it to 13. Okay. Um, we had maybe eight, maybe nine members that, uh, that formed the core for several years. And then from there, it then, you know, dwindled down to five, five main so. And then the sister spirit ritual, how big was that summer solstice? You know, I don't know how many people were actually in attendance to, to the week long of the weekend long event. I think for the women's mystery, um, golly, I would say Wow, maybe 30 or 40 women uh, formed, formed the, the circle for that. Wow, oh, that's a and sizable classroom size. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so to go from groups of seven to eight, nine people to, oh, wow, now there's 40. Right, right. Yeah. 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 That's quite a step. That was, that, that was, that was a huge step. Step. And what I discovered is that I really enjoyed um, doing those those rituals, and I I enjoyed um, hanging out with with those those women on on the larger community base of it. And I, what I what I found problematic, which is indicative. Unfortunately, it's Northwest and Portland is it uh, was and continues to be primarily dominant culture women, um, uh, white women, and <laughs> although many of them uh, really are excellent people, um, it, these were in the, the days before being woke was actually a thing, and so comments would come like, oh, don't you do this all the time? It's like, uh, no, why don't you 
get to know me first and do the friendship thing first and build some trust first and then launch into the particulars. But no, white women have a way of doing things their way, which is, ah! um, they, they believe it's respectful because they're curious and they want to know, but it's not. Um, it's intrusive. Um, and I, I often got the question, um, or it was the assumption that I had always practiced these traditions and that I was always uh, a, uh, a student of Santeria or I was always a student of the Duke. It's like, no, I'm like on a parallel path with you. <laughs> you know, we're on this path of learning simultaneously. And, and I mean, people would respond to me like, oh, you know so much. It's like, I only know what the oppressor has allowed us to know. And actually, that's actually a, a that, that has always been a, um, a, a difficult balancing act because how can one truly embrace spirituality if the if the framework, the format, the tradition are primarily based on the traditions of the conqueror. It's, it's not really of the people. Um, and so that's always been problematic. I mean, it was problematic when, when I was busy doing Christian science because, you know, that was based on not only patriarchy, but dominant culture, which is the conqueror. So it's like, was it really me? Uh, and my, my intuitive, uh, link to it was, was broken. Um, so yeah. And then, you know, this, this neo-pagan, although it was much more, uh, expansive and welcoming and satisfying, it still was, is based on traditions handed down by the oppressor. So it's like, eh. So. Yeah, I've struggled with that paradox for a long time myself. And I think it takes someone coming from outside the mainstream religion to even see it. Right, right. Because when, when you're in it, you don't see it. No. Um, at all. And, and when you try to tell a person that, that it's, it's like a whole nother language that they cannot hear. And so, yeah. Yeah. So I think you kind of answered the second question in a way, uh, unless you want to add something to it, which is which aspect of paganism do you identify with? Um, but I think maybe there might be, um, you definitely answered how long have you been this. So yeah. we can skip that question altogether. Do you want to add anything about how you describe yourself? Uh, sure. So I, <laughs> I'm, I'm still in the process of evolution. Um, I, I think that back in my 20s, I thought, oh, yay, now I know. I can stop now. It's like, no. And I thought, oh, 30s, yay, now I know. Oh, no, more. <laughs> and so... Uh, Currently, we, I, um, I'm practicing solo uh, because of pandemic. It's really difficult to gather with anyone um, currently, and the traditions are a amalgamation of of Celtic. Um, West African and Native American. Um, so yeah, my, my quest has morphed into identifying as, uh, Afro Native, um, which is exciting at, the, at very exciting. Um, 
as yet it's it's like one flips in one camp of of lived experience where the other one is just kind of feeling around trying to getting get a foundation of, of stability. Yeah. But but they both feel very comfortable at this point. So that's a good thing. Yeah, and I think comfort is a really big uh, component to what makes a good spiritual fit. Oh yeah, I mean, right. if, if, yeah, if you're not comfortable doing it, it's like, why do it? Um, because time is the most precious gift we are given and that we can give. And if you're using your time and you're feeling awkward or, or out of your skin, then why do it? I love that. I love that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing all of this, um, how do you think it has affected your life? Coming at your spirituality this way. It, uh, it's eliminated a vast portion <laughs> of guilt and shame which is really handy for, for my mental health. Um, traditional dominant culture, patriotic, uh, pa patriarchy based religion has a lot of guilt and shame uh, interwoven in it. And it has a lot of, a lot of rules. It's like, you can't do this, you can't do that. And no, there's only one, I mean, that, that whole, that whole, uh, what is it? Uh, slogan one way it's like no there are multiple ways your task if you choose to accept it is to figure out which one works for you and and you know and what the one that really uh fuels me is uh is a uh, wicca read do as you will and harm none and i've taken that to to the level of including not harming myself, um, which is, I think, paramount um, to, to quality of life and, and to embrace the natural world as, as an energy source, as a means of comfort, as a means of stability um, is wonderful. I mean, you just, it just doesn't get any better than that. And, and, and with my native um, ancestry that I'm still investigating and embedding myself in just a little bit, the one thing that I've heard uh, just this year, actually, was um, water is medicine. Water is the first medicine. And it's like, oh, yes, because water is life. It's like, makes perfect sense. And so, you know, embracing the, the energy and the spirit of water, the energy and spirit of, of growing things. Oh, I'm, I'm a plant person. I mean, I've got a house that's filled with plants, got a yard that's filled with plants, and I've been known as the plant lady. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's I'm, not a terrible nickname. It really isn't. No, no, no. Good no. words. Thank God it's not. Yeah, and uh, and I'm I'm a herbalist, and so I I've, I've studied herbs. Um, and yeah, I mean, if if I have a physical ailment that can be treated with with a home treatment of herbs, teas, oils. Um, you know, the, the whole family of, of remedies. It's like, yeah, please. And, um, I've, I've, uh, integrated that into my relationship with my medical primary care providers as well. Um, and they kind of look up at me like, uh, you want to drink a tea? I said, yes, please. <laughs> And they say, well, all right. And I say, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, um, how has it, um, it's provided a, a stability. It's provided um, a rhythm 
for connecting to the seasons of life. Um, sounds like a song lyric is in there somewhere. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really takes, it takes the power out of commercialism. It takes the power out of consumerism. Um, which I think is wonderful. Um, because we are a nation, a society that is, is driven by the marketplace. And the, I mean, and long ago, far away, when we were a different kind of society, the marketplace was not a bad place. You know, the marketplace was a place where you, one could go and get their needs met, you know, on so many levels, you know, and it, it was a good thing. Yet it's, it has evolved into this creature that consumes us. Um, and that's a bad thing. And the really bad thing is it, it's consuming the mother. And the mother is having a very hard, hard time with it. And yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, not, not a moment goes by that I, I don't give thanks for the gifts that the mother gives. And I mean, because the only gift that I can give is the gift that the mother gives me. And that's, that's all there is. There is no, you know, there's nothing else. So. And that's a and really it, interesting way to look at that. I, I really totally appreciate that. And you were uh, going to add something. Well, I, I've um, schooled uh, my, uh, my daughter. Well, okay, let me back up a little bit. So in the 90s is 1995, as a matter of fact, is when I met my sweetheart, my wife, Priscilla, and she too was another entry into the pagan community of uh, Metro Portland via the um, Nine Houses of Gaia. And so via her, um, I and my daughter Andresa, we started attending very regularly, like just like Bakke, um, Nine Houses of Gaia um, Fall Equinox. And so we would do Fall Equinox. Uh, and then in the summer, we would do Sister Spirit Summer Solstice. Um, and then, let's see. And then when Day of the Dead would come, would come around in November, then we would do theater <laughs> that featured the altars of the Day of the Dead. So we, so we just followed the year with the various celebrations of life and celebrations of death. So, yeah. Before Nine Houses, this is not the answer to the question, but before Nine Houses of Gaia, um, I would do Lu, Lunasa with Circle of the Dance. And gosh, that's how I met. That's how I met Ross, um, and Diane, and others. That was, you know, I don't really have any any anecdotal tales because it it's all well. The primary has been a, just a series of of discovery um, and making community and participating in, in ritual or, or, or doing ritual or being asked to facilitate um, women's mysteries or women's ritual. And um, yeah, nothing really, nothing really stands out because I, I see myself as, uh, as a walking, talking marquee for diversity, <laughs> as a uh, representation in the flesh of a person who is spiritual and does not look like dominant culture and does not function in the pre pre described stereotype of what a person who looks like me should act like. So I'm I'm an educational unit. Um, 
from, from the minute that you say hello to the moment that, that we part ways. Because um, I'm, I'm over the mind of each one teach one. And it's so important that at least some, some, some awakening happen uh, with the interaction. I mean, it, it's actually never really my goal. It's just the hope. Um, because what I have learned and has to demonstrate is that, um, you know, white folks need to talk to each other. And so if I can talk to one of you, then I always encourage you to go talk to one of you, you all. Because <laughs> then you'll hear it. <laughs> and then you'll say, oh, really? Gosh, you know, we're not that much different. Right, right, full moment. We're not that different at all. So anyway. Well, I wanted to share with you and my audience the one anecdote that, that comes to mind when I think of you and your family is when our two daughters first met. And they must have been maybe five years old because they're the same age. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was out at Ross and Diane's property oh. at a sister spirit event. Right, 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 right. And here are these two little girls running hand in hand through the fields, swinging in the hammocks together. Like they have no cares in the world. There's no rules. They got dirty. They had a blast and... I think that every little girl, every little child needs that sort of freedom to just grab a friend by the hand and jump into a hammock and say, you're my best friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. nobody cares. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, you know, to, to add on to that, one of the things that I truly like about going to festival is um, taking Andresa and knowing that there's like a whole community who would take care of her without me asking or begging or paying or, you know it's just it was a given and that these were the children of the community and it was the adult's responsibility to you know take them on and and to keep them safe i mean i, I don't know how many times i mean even at at uh, at silver falls or fall equinox i was you know it's like a huge space acres right it's like no nope, andrew's she'd be gone. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> She's here somewhere. <laughs> and not only was she there, I knew she was safe. She was safe from the harm. And I think that the, the biggest thing about uh, the, the takeaway from uh, the pagan community is that we, we embrace love and express love, which then is translated into safety, personal safety, um, spiritual safety, emotional safety, um, for the most part. I mean, there, there are some hiccups, of course. Um, and there are some things, you know, some bad things that happen on occasion. But essentially, it's like, oh my goodness, if we could push the needle more toward that, that mindset and and that framework, we would be such a healthier people. Um, and that's why I'm still in it. I mean, that's why I'm still in, in the pagan community, you know, the best of my ability given the pandemic. And I'm still doing social justice work um, because I, I still have hope, I still have faith. And I'm, you know, every, every, every time I wake up, it's like, okay, I've got another turn at bat. Let's try to hit it out of the ballpark and let's try to reach at least one person. And if I can reach one person, I've done the job for that day. That's excellent. I love that. And I'm guessing that we're going to tie that into this is also how you serve the community. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at, at this point, it's, uh, not not too much, really, um, because I've um, oh years ago I think back um, I think the last back around two thousand I think it was two thousand three I guess it was I started stepping back um, I was involved with Sister Spirit for quite some time. 
and uh, they're a, they're a good group. Um, Fredo's the best. Um, Just yeah, wanted to say I did interview Fredo in an earlier episode. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, right. So, right. Yeah. yeah, I uh, she she invited me to uh, give a pre presentation at her Portland State Women's Studies Spirituality class uh, a couple times, and that that was really good. Um, and uh, so yeah, I started saying to people, you know, there are other colored girls out there <laughs> who need a chance. <laughs> How about you reach out to them? Um, yeah. And, and they always got so sad, like, oh, but we know you. I said, yeah, and you can work on your social skills and you can reach out and guess what? You can find somebody else. <laughs> Well, you are such a joy to speak to and uh, so articulate. I can see why they would be sad to not have you show up. <laughs> so let me ask you this. How do you think your spirituality affects your mental health? <sighs> yeah. Um, mindfulness and uh prayer the uh blessing um is very grounding um and connecting connecting to water connecting to the air connecting to uh soil trees it's it's just so grounding and it doesn't take a lot of effort on my part it just requires awareness awareness that that the air i breathe gives gives me life you know that that um that fire is my spirit and that the sun gives life is my life um and that the four cardinal directions are real and and are supportive and don't, I mean, don't require anything. It just requires acknowledgement. Like, it doesn't get any better than that. It just, hi, acknowledge us that we are here and, and we are a part of you and you are a part of us. And that can never be broken, no matter what. It just requires awareness. And it is so affirming and it is so uh grounding and it's comforting and you know um ah, here's here's an interesting take on me so um uh this year it's been pointed out to me <laughs> in no uncertain sense that um my reaction to snow is actually a phobia it's like oh who knew it was a phobia <laughs> it's the snow white stuff falling out of the sky and you're terrified of it. <laughs> it's like, okay. So that element of water, um, which I find terrifying, is just something I get to be one with. Um, and, and realize my, my emotional limitations with it. And at the same time, just acknowledge that it just is and that it's okay and it's just water and it's the water that will you know that can and does uh dissolve pain into the void in which it came it's like no oh, okay i can walk in the snow as long as they get back home <laughs> But you know what? What I'm saying is that it it gives a perspective on it that that means I don't have to do uh, ingest a human created farmer uh, pharmacological item in order to be at peace with it, right? And it's the same with 
um, slight depression, which comes and goes. It's, it's not huge, but in just embracing that this is, this is where I'm at in that moment and follow my breath that gives me life, then I can get through that moment. And to acknowledge that water is life. So drinking water will get me through the moment. And that the earth is my body. And that it can dissolve this, this momentary mania <laughs> back into the void in which it came. Like, oh, I can make it through this moment. And to acknowledge that time is the most precious gift there is, then when I'm in that moment of angst or whatever, all I need to do is get to the next one. And it's okay. It just means I get another try. And for, you know, anybody who's actually noticing, I've made it to, to the other end. And it's like, yeah, you know, and I didn't need to pop a pill or I didn't need to, you know, do something self-destructive. Yes, those are options. I mean, the mother gives us all kinds of options. Um, but there's also this little thing called self-determination, which is the second principle of Kwanzaa, which is Kuzi Jagalia. So there you go. Life is good. Yeah, I like that. So backing up a second to touch back on Kwanzaa, mm. um, a couple of questions that pop up whenever the subject shows up. And um, and I know, you know, pretty much what the real answers are, <laughs> but I'd like to know your take on it um, about Kwanzaa being uh, not a replacement for Christmas or Hanukkah or any of the other right. holidays, yeah. but an addition to. Right, right. And what I... I think the one thing I really like about Kwanzaa is not it's not based on the traditions of the dominant culture. It's not based on the on the format of of the oppressor. It's truly a African derivative, African American tradition of of celebrating community the uh, celebrating abundance and harvest now granted here in the pacific northwest it's it's kind of a twist of the brain to do harvest in december <laughs> but if you look at it from a indigenous lens uh thanksgiving can happen um, anytime the people come together. And we give thanks for being able to come together. We give thanks for the elders that came before us so that we could come together. We give thanks for, for the children who can come together because they are the future. Um, and coming together to give thanks, it's not seasonal. It, you know, it's, I, I give uh, daily thanks and do blessings um, before I eat uh, my two meals a day, you know. Uh, what is it? Uh, Chrissy uh, knows it. It's, um, oh, uh, Mother Darksome, Father Divine, blesses food, blesses wine, grant me health, wealth, wisdom, the eternal tree. And it's like, yeah, that's it. And, and so getting back to Kwanzaa, it, uh, as some people may know, um, it uh, was founded or began in, in the mid 60s. The year is quoted as being 1966 um, by a African-American scholar uh, who was at, I would say UC Berkeley, because everything progressive comes out of UC Berkeley. <laughs> It, it may not be Berkeley, but it was a University of California um, college. And he wanted to craft a truly 
uh, African American tradition of harvest and community uh, based on seven principles uh, that support creativity, uh, effort, uh, self sufficiency, uh, community, family, uh, the arts, um, and the spirit of belonging and and the uh, importance of maintaining hope and faith um, because we are a resilient people. Um, you know, the, the dominant cultures of the world have been trying to extinguish us for as long as they've been in contact with us and we ain't gone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, when will they get it in their heads? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're still involved in, in, in genocide. Um, you know, and same with, with my, with my uh, Native ancestors. It's like, we are resilient. Ever since the Europeans, you know, touched ground on, on Turtle Island, they've been trying to extinguish us. And we ain't gone. We are resilient. We are survivors. And so... Uh, Kwanzaa is a affirmation of the uh, resiliency of the people and the determination to not only survive, but to thrive. And so how can that be a replacement for Christmas? How can that be a replacement for Hanukkah? Because if you want to turn the page on Hanukkah, that is yet another story of resilience and survival and thriving. If you look at, at Christmas, which at least in the States is a children's holiday. Children are great, children are the future. Uh, we love them dearly, without them we wouldn't be here or go there. Uh, <laughs> but you know, but Christmas is, is a celebration of faith and hope. And so how can Kwanzaa be a replacement for that? I mean, they all go together. It's just it's just a different lens to look at the same thing. It's like looking at, at, at a, a prism and how the light fractures, but it's the same ray of light. Yeah, I like that take. That's a really, I appreciate your, your perspective on that for sure. And thank you very much for your, uh, your, your, your approach on that. Um, so let's wrap this up with the final question which is any advice for seekers on the path? <laughs> uh, oh, talk to your elders or talk to the elders. Make friends with the elders. Um, the elders uh, have walked this path longer than you and they can share their wisdom with you. Um, but one, one Native woman that I started making friends with, she said, um, the every, everything I know about my culture is from reading. It's like, uh, kind of sad, but kind of true. So um, read. Um, and and to that, I would add the, um, oh, I, I did AA for a while. <laughs> and uh, one, of, one of the sayings is take what you need and leave the rest. And in regards to reading about spirituality and about uh, any, any spiritual path or pagan path, take what you need and leave the rest. Because everything is through a filter. And not everything will speak to you. And if it doesn't speak to you, don't keep staring at it because there's a reason why it's not speaking to you. <laughs> and and when when the universe, or as one friend says, multiverse speaks to you, then listen because there's a reason why they're talking to you. Um. And and don't be silly. Don't you know? Don't do these willy nilly things like. Oh well, the universe, well, the multiverse told me to do this, so this is what I'm doing. It. It's like have some common sense. 
you know, just, you know, but the Lord and the lady, the creator gave us common sense for a reason. It's so that we wouldn't hurt ourselves and we wouldn't hurt others. So use it and be wise. Um, and, and remember that you're not the only one on, on this journey. You, there are, there are many people on this journey. And remember, your lane is not the only lane. This is many lanes and all lanes don't go to the same place. And that's okay too. Um, and be, be weary of the one that says, uh, this is the only way because it's not. And young people fall for that trap every blast of time because they're young. And that's okay. We all need to be young because then we get to be old, which is really pretty good. And then we get to die, which is actually kind of better because then we get to leave. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> I don't know if I can top that one, Karen. Um, <laughs> But let's go ahead and call it a uh, call it a wrap. I really appreciate your uh, ex uh, perspective and candor and um, your humor uh, oh. to boot, it, because that's what makes the world go round. In my personal opinion, oh yeah, um, laughter is is the, the best medicine oh, next to water. Is. <laughs> it is. Thank you very much, and I'm gonna stop the recording. So that was a lot of fun, and I'm really glad that um, I was able to interview her and get this interview um, in the public eye before it was like middle of next year or something. So um, do subscribe if you enjoy my content. Um, I'm going to keep bringing more great interviews. I've got another one in the works being edited right now. So uh, stay tuned and have a great new year.